when I was a youth immigrant. Um, and I work for the City of Durham Office on Youth as a project assistant. I want to also allow my wonderful speakers uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to pitch it to you and then everyone else can follow. All right, hello everyone. My name is Amina Jenkins. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm from Durham, North Carolina, and I'm currently at Meredith College studying public policy and education and getting my 9 through 12 social studies licensure. Um, and I'll pass it off to Isa. Thanks, Amina. Good to see you. Um, thank you for having me in this space. Uh, my name is Isa Deering. I use she or they pronouns. I was born and raised in Durham, and I'm currently a senior history and environmental science major, geography minor, studying at Howard University, um, getting an MA in global affairs next year uh, from the Schwartzman Scholarship. So happy to be here. Oh, and I'll kick it to Chris. I'm Chris. I'm glad to be here. My, pronoun, my pronouns are him, his. And I'm currently a junior at Durham School of the Arts. Right now I'm working with the Office of Youth and Fayetteville Street Fellows. And my arts that I pursue at Durham School of the Arts is guitar and creative writing. Thank you all so much uh, for introducing yourselves. As you can tell, we are in very good company. Uh, so this is a very great conversation. It makes me so excited. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'm going to pitch it to you, Isa, to get us started on the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So to give a little bit about my background, I never really saw myself as someone who would be an advocate for climate justice and environmental justice. And that's because like growing up in Durham, while I had this really close relationship with nature, um, I would go to park nearby parks and actually this like little landfill that was near my house to kind of just explore and just remove myself from the chaos of home. I didn't really see myself advocating around what I thought were the environmental issues of the time, like sea level rise and polar bears. I thought those issues were super distant from the Durham community. It, it just wasn't something that I faced every day and was relatable to what young people of color in Durham were struggling with. But I began organizing like around racial equity issues with organizations like the Office on Youth Made in Durham um, in high school. And I quickly realized that everything was connected. And that's why uh, my friend and I in this picture, Elijah King, uh, co-founded the Durham Youth Climate Justice Initiative to create an intentional space for young people of color in climate justice. And the picture that you're looking at here is our 2020 uh, vigil for George Floyd hosted by the Durham Youth Climate Justice Initiative. We just felt that it was important to bring um, not only just healing to our community, but also kind of recentering the fact that, I, I don't know, we just heard that around Durham that issues like police brutality just weren't happening in Durham. And we wanted to kind of recenter that narrative that we see racial equity issues in Durham every day, especially as young people of color. So we advocated around issues like school resource officers in public schools and um, just unfair uh, food inequities, uh, housing inequities and so on. But I'll pass it back to you, Nori. Yeah, um, Chris, Amina, would you all like to share out? Yeah, I can go next. Um, so I was born in Rhode Island, but I moved to North Carolina when I was three and then to Durham when I was seven. And I've considered Durham to be my home ever since just because of the connections I've made and stuff. But um, my mom actually grew up in Durham as well in the same area that we lived in um, when we first moved here. And hearing her stories and experiences of also going to the same high school that I went to and how there were a lot of parallels, but also how a lot of the differences exacerbated a lot of the issues that I saw during my time in high school was always very eye opening. But um, during my time in high school, one of the main things that I noticed was that there was 
there were stark differences in the educational experiences of black and brown students compared to white students. And it wasn't just because of the communities that we grew up in and how different they were or the experiences that we had with those communities, but it had to do a lot with how the, like I said mentioned, how systems were interconnected and how a lot of those systems did what they could to make sure that students didn't have those opportunities. Um, I spent a lot of time in high school trying to figure out what exactly it was that I was passionate about. Um, my sophomore year of high school, a friend and I led a Black Lives Matter rally and seeing not only that students were passionate about that, but that they were looking for some place to have the, their voices heard was very eye-opening. And so her name is Bethlehem, by the way. Um, so Bethlehem and I started a club called Allies for Racial Equity at our school to kind of centralize what the, that conversation and what those voices were um, and a, kind of understand a little bit more about where those experiences were going and where they were coming from. But there were also just so many different things going on in the world and also within our community um, that we, I personally was trying to figure out what it was that I cared about. And I realized that it was education because I feel like education is like a convergence of all of those issues um, and isn't very openly talked about. Um, and then I think Chris may be able to talk a little bit more about this, but being in high school, trying to balance like that experience of being a student while also being a person and an individual in your community is, it, it's very difficult, it's very hard. Well, for me, I grew up in Durham all my life, all 16 years of my life. So I got to a certain age where I started to realize how things where I lived, it was it was always, I feel like Durham was always a city where people would talk crap about, in my opinion. And I would hear and I'm just like, mm -hmm. it's so bad. Why why move here? Like I like all my friends, they'll tell me. Like growing up, they tell me, oh, I'm not from here. I'm not from Durham. I'm like, you came here and you're complaining. And then I just took, I took it as, wow, that means there's something really wrong with this place. And then when I heard my mom telling stories, my mom came from D.C. So she grew up in D.C. And she would always tell me about how bad the potholes were, how bad some of the bus stops were. Uh, it was just a bunch of unsafe areas, areas there. And it kind of sounded like Durham. So I was like, dang. And I think last year or the beginning of this year, sometime around that time was when my mom had told me about this organization that I was working with, the Go Durham Bus Project. This spoke out to me because I remember when she used to tell me about how bad the bus stops were here and how bad they were in D.C. So I'm like, Dang, people got places to go and they don't even got, they have no protection over their head from any type of bad weather or not, not even a place to sit down when they waiting for the bus. And a bus stop could be in a really unsafe area, a really bad environment, but that depends on the people in that environment as well. So I wanted to, I wanted to do something about that because I thought it was unfair. Also, Another thing that I'm with right now is the Fayetteville Street Fellows. This is where, as you can see on the Zoom, this is where, um, well, the picture on the left is when I was taking surveys and asking people, like, how do they feel about the bus stops here in Durham? And everybody pretty much said the same thing. They felt like it was either in poor condition or a bad environment or not enough seats. They didn't have no complaints about the bus arriving late or anything like that. It was more so just like the bus stops itself. Uh, the one on the right, that was also, that was the same day. But also what I was doing was, I was also a volunteer to help put everything together for this event that we were at. This was at the Hayta, I forgot what it was called. But I was also there with those two people, our, are a part of my team because I'm the youth leader. I'm the leader. So we help set up, set up these events and break down the events. But the part about doing that is I like seeing how many people are actually like come to the event and socialize because it's like, wow, that's a lot of people 
to you, like it will be random people like people will be driving on the street and then they'll stop by to see what's going on when we have these events it won't like it was scheduled people or it was people that was supposed to be there but um i really enjoyed that because i also felt like i was doing something for durham like i felt like i was doing something for my city i felt like i was and i was bringing people together and making them feel like a safe place it's a safe place to be another thing that i did was this was recently um working with the fayetteville street fellows again y'all heard that wheels is being taken down correct like wheels is being turned mm -hmm. into a recreation yeah so my mother she told me about this and I was like, dang, that's bad. Cause that's what me and my cousin, we used to, we used to love skating. So we still love skating. So um, we just, when she told me that, I'm like, I'm like, why, like why? But then I heard that people would like go there. They would use that as a location to, to fight or do other stuff. So I was like, oh, so it's kind of like the mall but they trying to get rid of it instead of change the curfew on it. Cause at first, what we really was happening during COVID, they like closed it completely. Then they tried to open it back up on certain days. Then they would shut it down completely again. And then that's when they said they were going to turn it into a recreation center, but they didn't know what they were going to do with the skate rink. So then my mom helped us set up this website for people to sign this petition on what should what should they do for what should they do with the skating rink and most people who signed it said that they should keep it we had a goal to reach a thousand so all me and my cousin did was just share it on instagram and we made a whole instagram account just just for that website for the petition and within two days i think we got like 2,500 people to sign on the petition. The only thing it required was your name and your email and why you want Wheels to stay alive. So that was really good. I also felt like I did something because the skate rink to me is like a place for people my age to get together and hang out at. Besides them being childish and like fighting there, I don't think they should take it down because it's like that's also taken away from black people. Not not saying that white people couldn't come, but it was more so like I feel like you would see a lot of black people there. Like that was a black people thing for us in Durham. Like that was a place that everyone got together, everybody got along, everybody enjoyed themselves. Nobody felt nobody should have felt unsafe in that environment. Yeah. Thank you oh, for that, Chris. Can I quickly comment on what Chris said? Because I Absolutely. think like what Chris said is so important. Like they're taking down wheels. And I threw it in the chat as well. Like South Point now has an age restriction, like during prime hours that are just more accessible to young people. So it just makes me think like who Durham is prioritizing in make in this kind of decision making, because mm -hmm. now young people, especially young people of color, just don't have anywhere to gather safe safely because i know northgate south point wheels those used to be the spots like were. For, for me to like go and see my friends like the parks that were close to my house like my mom just didn't think those were safe like east end close to my house like in walking distance but she didn't want me to go there after dark so these were places that i could feel safer gathering with my young people and young people will gather regardless of what like restrictions or what's available to them so the fact that we're just taking away these spaces like makes our youth more vulnerable, makes people that look like us more vulnerable. So I'm just like really considering what uh, Durham is thinking right now, to be honest. And going off of that point, Isa, I mean, statistics show that between after school, those peak hours, like you were mentioning, are very instrumental in how young people, um, their outcomes, specifically with extracurriculars. And that is why a lot of times schools are supposed to advocate for more accessible extracurriculars for students because it increases their opportunity, but also decreases their opportunities for interacting or, or for engaging in adverse behaviors or negative behaviors. Um, but one, the way we define extracurriculars has always been within the confines of a school and not what a child can do outside of school. And it, it is always related to the work and the labor that they're expected to do. So joining clubs, having some type of designated output, 
but not enough emphasis on leisure time or the fact that leisure time can be considered instrumental to a child's growth. But speaking of Northgate, Northgate is currently being remodeled for this new Durham and what they're prioritizing is literally what you see with Northgate. And I find it very interesting that we can have people coming in to change Nordstrom for the better, or Nordstrom, Northgate for the better, um, because they believe it'll bring in more opportunities when one, they're pushing people out and two, the children who came there for their leisure time and for their extracurriculars are being deprioritized compared to the people who are currently trying to make these plans seem like they're for the betterment of Durham, whose children already have these opportunities and already have the ability to engage in leisure time and extracurriculars that black and brown children do not have. That is a word. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, I, I kind of want to uh, sort of pin this question up. Um, but for you all to sort of tell us about, you know, your experience of, as youth activists, um, you know, what are your, you know, what areas are you organizing in? I know Isa and Chris, y'all, y'all got into that. So, you know, add any additional information uh, to that. Um, but what was it like when you first got involved? Um, when did you feel like you were really stepping into your power and, and sort of like talk about where you're at now, um, you know, on your journey? I'll go first if you don't mind. Uh, really, when I felt like I was like really helping Durham was like back to that skate thing because it wasn't like I just got a bunch of teenagers to sign it. I had adults asking me about it too. There was like, oh, so y'all are like trying to get wheels back? I'm like, yeah, that's what we're shooting for right now. We're still in the process of doing that. And uh, we still have more to do. What we were gonna do was we was gonna post videos like about why we wanna keep it. Cause once we got everyone, it was like, okay, what's the next step? Well, now we gotta really push this and make skits or something so we can advertise why we wanna keep wheels instead of letting it be nothing or be turned into a swimming pool or something. But right now, yeah, we're just current. That's what we're currently working on. That's yeah. what, yeah, that's what we're currently working on. And Chris, that really makes me happy that y'all are doing that because that was definitely a place I went to with my friends. I, I think even when I was like gotten up in age, I was still very much going there. No, seriously, I I have so many memories of wheels. Like I was in roll bounce, sort of God, at, at wheels. But to answer the question, I mean, like youth organizing in Durham when I first got started, honestly, it felt really disheartening. I like mm. talking to leaders, even working with um, supposed adult allies felt really tokenizing at times. Mm. They were just wanting to use. Um, the idea that they have youth in their spaces and they're listening to young people, but really our values and goals just don't align. And we're not like adults just weren't listening to like the tangible action items and um, support to be honest that we needed from them. So like even in organizing uh, the protests, like honestly, it, it felt like I was speaking to a community that just wasn't uh, reciprocating my energy that wasn't uh, fully hearing me. They were there for the aesthetic of Black Lives Matter and not really there um, to hear that we need school resource officers out of Durham Public Schools. And places where I feel like the most powerful, I, I would say, is just like when I'm organizing within my own community, like the Durham Youth Climate Justice Initiative has always tried to make climate education more accessible to young people of color specifically. So we're, we go to the communities that we're in, we go to the high schools, we go to rec centers and hold our conversations there safe when it is safe, of course. So that's when I felt the most powerful, like just being among my people, but being out in the community at times, it's, it's extremely taxing to try to um, work among folks that just aren't really your allies. I mean, I don't know if you have the same experience with Made in Toronto. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Isa. One of, they said it so well. I mean, the tokenization that takes place within youth organizing is insane because young people usually start this work on their own. 
And so often they are infiltrated by adults and adult organizations who claim that they want to help, but in reality, it's just using their voices to further narratives that they believe are the most important. And they don't ask. Like we saw this with movements across the board um, this last summer, people were trying to do things and they never asked what the people who were involved or being the most impacted needed. And like, so this picture right here um, was from a Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter rally that my friend Bethlehem and I, she's holding up the all I, if all lives matter sign uh, right there, that's her. But um, that is from the protest we planned our sophomore year. And in this picture, this is like right when people started to come, but we had kids in the lobby, down the side hallways, they had to close the front aspect, the front area of the school because there were that many students. It was insane. I thought it was a fire hazard, but they didn't say anything, which is fine. But from that, you would think that school officials would know that this isn't just a one-time thing and that it's not a phase and that this isn't students just doing something for the sake of doing it and that it mattered. But from there on, it was literally a fight to be heard. I was invited into several spaces, not just within my school, but also within the district. They had um, this leadership thing where they had the student body president from every school and then a student leader that the principal picked who would come to these meetings and speak with the superintendent directly about some of the issues that we saw. And it was crazy to me that I would be asked for my opinion and not only would my opinion be invalidated in the spaces publicly but then they wouldn't even be taken into consideration yet we were given certificates at school boards and recognized on the website and asked to come speak at panels and stuff like that and it never ever made sense to me why you would want me to talk so much about my adverse experiences and the experiences of other students and why you would want me even my senior year of high school, we sent out a survey to the entire student body to ask them about their experiences. And I hand counted over 500 surveys on my own and put a survey and put a presentation together to present to faculty and staff at my school and they did nothing with it. You ask young people to do all of this work constantly. And I'll, I can talk a little bit more about that later and it's taxing, but I got involved because these were issues that were affecting me and affecting my friends. It wasn't something where like I was taking a class and I was doing it for credit, not saying everyone will do that, but like this was something that regardless of if I was or wasn't involved inside of the school, these were issues that were going to impact me for the rest of my life and still have. Mm -hmm. um, and it, when it comes to where I really felt like se I stepped into my power, I'm honestly still not sure about that because of so much of my young organizing experience was tokenized and taken advantage of and diminished. But I will say as a person, so like separate from my organizing, um, I feel the most empowered when I'm in spaces like this, where I'm talking with people who know what I've gone through, who validate my experiences, but more importantly, understand that the work that has to be done is not currently being done, if that makes sense. Mm. And I, I just to jump in real quick, I see Sharice Frederick asked like, how can adults support youth work in a way that's not tokenizing? Pay us. I mean, youth, like the labor that Amina was talking about, Chris was talking about, like we are out here doing this work for free and we don't really have the time or like extra resources to be able to, you know, dedicate our lives to these causes, right? We have school, we have work, we have lives. So if you, if adults really wanna support us in a way that represents authentic allyship, help us do some of this grunt work, help us by donating to our campaigns and compensating us for our time. And I also wanted to um, kind of circle back to what Amina was talking about earlier and Chris was talking about earlier, how youth, like our lived experiences as young people are often not enough for adult um, or decision makers to, you know, credit as expertise. Like we, Chris, we, we've all lived in Durham. Like Chris has taken the bus. Chris knows that um, there's no bus covers, there's no bus seats. That's, that's unsafe, that's um, uncomforting. So why are these lived experiences um, invalidated and minimized by our decision makers? So I, I think that kind of Durham city um, adult in general, just like need a general rethinking of what expertise looks like and kind of listen to the voices of young people in a very authentic way, so. Yeah, Isa just reminded me of something, I don't know, I heard it at some session a couple of years ago, but people are often, the most marginalized communities are often asked to fix the problems that they never created. 
And the worst, the worst part about that is you're asked to engage in solutions. And then if they don't work out or they don't pan out, all of the blame is put on you. And it is, it is weird. It is a very weird situation or a, a position to be in. Like Isa said, you don't really have enough lived experiences all the time to like be able to generate solutions or like enough information, but you do have enough experiences to know that something is wrong. Um, but I think going off of the question, Sharice's question, I think another way that adults in general can just be more supportive is when you are looking at what your expected outcomes are, looking look at who you're centering. If you plan on centering young people, then your solutions should not be created by adults who've been working in an industry for 20 plus years that have not been working for those people. Your solutions should be generated by the people who are coming to you and telling you that something is wrong. And every action that you engage in, every meeting you have, every program you plan should not be dictated by those people. It should be dictated by the concerns and the, the critiques that young people are giving you. Otherwise, it, it is literally it doesn't make any sense you're not you're not doing anyone any type of justice can i get an amen in the chat like i just i need all of that to be affirmed because yes um i i want to ask you all like you know to to get in a little bit to if you have any ways how have you been able to navigate um those those experiences as when you are being tokenized and when you're not really being um affirmed and listened to I think it's twofold. I mean, one, you can definitely talk about or explain how you're being tokenized to the people who are tokenizing you in those spaces. But honestly, there are times when you just have to leave. And that's what I've kind of had to come to terms with, where sometimes you cannot exist in someone else's spaces. You have to create your own and you have to push for that space to be validated. And it is hard. It is hard. And I think Isa can talk a little bit about this, like making your own space as a young person is empowering, but it can also be difficult because of like access to resources or community connections you may not have in the same way that other established organizations do. Yeah, no, seriously. I know this has been something that the Durham Youth Climate Justice Initiative has struggled with. Like, how do we create these safe spaces for young people of color when we don't necessarily have the time or resources to gather? So mm. we're kind of like struggling with, okay, we're, we are um, suffering from all of these environmental injustices. We should be the ones to solve them. Yet I got class at 9am <laughs> or I got, I got to go to work after school. Right. So it's, it's like, how do we find this balance and I think the way I kind of navigate this is like really finding um systems of support that I can trust and that compensate me for my work and that um support me in ways that are authentic I have I, there are several there are many adult-led organizations that are truthfully like here to support young people and don't want any credit for it don't need like any sort of tokenization or any sort of gratification from youth work, but are here to authentically lift youth voices up. So I really depend on those organizations for their support. I don't know if Chris wants to drop, jump in and speak on it too. Well, from be honest, I was kind of agreeing with y'all was saying, but I didn't get the question. I missed the question. If you don't yeah. mind asking again, yeah, the question was, is, you know, navigating um, situations where you feel like you're being tokenized when um, you're not really being affirmed or listened to, like, how do you navigate that? Well, in my opinion, I do feel like we as young people aren't heard because adults try to tell us, well, back in my day, like, they say things like that, and I'm like, this is not your day anymore. So you can't, you can't tell me how to feel. You can try to help me instead of telling me how to feel. Cause I hear it from, I get it from my parents a lot. They say, well, back in my day, we didn't do things like this. And I'm like, back in your day, did coronavirus hit y'all? And did y'all have to do school on a computer and stuff? Like, did y'all have to worry about being anti so like getting used to being anti-social if you are a social person or i guess staying in the house with the same people because that can really mess with your mentality as well that can 
that can like if you're doing the same thing over and over again, you're gonna go insane and then it's gonna be an issue because you're repeating the same cycle. But I I can't say like I don't know necessarily how I would navigate. The most I can do at my age is try my hardest to speak up for people. Cause especially with my sister, like my dad, well, with me and my dad, he tries to tell me that I act like I have everything figured out. When I don't act like that, it's more so of me focusing on what I have to do now because I try to live more in the now as far as worrying about what happened back then or worrying about what's going to happen in the next two days. It gotta, I got to try to get everything done on what I'm doing now so I won't be so I won't be so mixed, mixed up in the head. And then <laughs> the thing, somebody about to say something. Oh, and then the thing with um, how I was saying with my sister, like me and my sister, we're both teenagers. So that's another thing. Like, I feel like they're, they think, they think that we think that we know everything when I know that I don't know everything and we, we know we don't know everything. So it's not us trying to be smart or trying to act like we have everything figured out. It's us trying to figure things out because we got to go through like how to feel about this. We got to go through different emotions as far as what what this virus did to us. I ain't, It was really hard for me doing work on a computer and then I actually got sick at one point and I won't go, I couldn't go to school for a couple of weeks in person. So that also messed me up. Another thing is with this, I don't know if it's the teachers or the school. I want to say the school in general, they, they say they're trying to help us like, cause they understand what's going on. But I don't think one thing I don't think we should have is late work. I don't think they should be hard on late work. I think, it should get turned in whenever by the end of the quarter. Like, if it's an assignment that you didn't do, then, oh, well, it's going to be a zero for now. But if you turn it in, just get it graded as if it was turned in on time. Because people, like, how, um, is her name Isa? I think it's Isa. How she said, we got school, and then if we have a job, we got school and a job. So it's like, they're not trying to work around our schedule. They want us to work around theirs, which is unfair. It's backwards. Yeah, which I, I very much agree with, Chris. It's like definitely taking some time to be in collaboration with each other and also having understanding for the positions that we're in. I mean, you're going to say something. Yeah, I just want to validate what Chris was saying, especially about the late work policy. I mean, I'm not a teacher yet, but getting your teaching license and observing in classrooms is very eye-opening about the role that teachers play as this middleman, because I mean, in any job, you know, you have your boss and there are things you have to do for that job specifically, but with the teacher, with teachers, your boss is the district and whatever standards that district sets, and then who you're impacting are your students. And I, I mean, like the obvious answer to because sometimes teachers will say like, well, I can't accept a lot of late work whenever because that's too much stuff for me to grade, right? And the obvious answer sometimes is we'll stop assigning so much work. And like, as someone who wants to teach, I want to do that so bad. I don't want my classroom to be test-based and I don't want it to be assignment-based, but teachers operate in districts where they are test-based districts. I mean, just looking at Durham Public Schools within the last five or six years, we have shifted completely from an outcomes-based system that is solely reliant on test scores. And that is exactly what we have centered. We have centered um, district or school uh, report cards and not school report cards to ensure the benefits, that these benefits are spread to all students, but that the overall scores are improved. Uh, that happened at my school where we wanted to see the overall grade of our school go from a 69 to a 70, which all that meant was a few more white kids had to do better on the test, which is exactly what happened. And then we got mm. the grade that we wanted and we kept it pushing. But teachers are not, some teachers are responsible for perpetuating those issues. Sure, but districts will impose a lot of these standards onto teachers where 
we have no choice, we, they have no choice but to enact them because they also make salaries contingent on test scores and your, just your job in general contingent on test scores, which again, goes back to impacting the students and connects to the bigger picture of centering young people's voices and the solutions that you're generating. A test score does not dictate who a child is, but it also doesn't tell you what's wrong with your district. And I think that that happens so much where we center things that are not important for anyone, but the people who wanna make them important. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I do wanna get a, a, into a little bit, um, just knowing that the work can be difficult mentally, physically, uh, emotionally and spiritually even. Uh, you know, tell us about how you are protecting yourselves um, and centering your mental health and um, replenishing your cup um, in the midst of it all. Like, um, you know, and what role does community play into that? I was going to say something first because I'm big on having mental stability. My dad is big on having mental stability. That's why I am. Because if your head isn't right, then you're not going to be right as a person. So you always want to have something to do to keep you sane and keep you, I don't want to say plugged into the world because you don't want to be completely plugged into the world. You want to be, you want something that's there to unplug you. Like, you don't want to be so caught up in trending things. You want to be so you don't want to be so caught up in every everything that's going on with their generation. You also want to have something. You also want to have something different. Like you don't want to be you don't want to be a square. You don't want to be a box because if you flip a box over, then it's just going to land on the straight side. It's not going to roll. You can't roll a box. If you got a circle, it's going to roll into different things. You roll up, you roll, you ever take a ball, you ever threw a ball, like one of them rubber balls, you threw it on the ground, it bounced every which way because it don't got no straight direction. You don't got to be such in a straight line. It's okay to take detours. It's okay to take breaks and come back. You can always come back to the normal thing you was always doing, but you don't want to stay on that same track because then you're not going to know anything else. And then you basically going to dumb yourself down. You want to be open. So one thing that I've been doing is I've been trying to focus on reading music more with my guitar. Another thing, another thing I've been doing is, um, well, exercising because it feels good to feel like you look good, <laughs> but it's a good thing to do because you don't want to, you know how court, like when we were in, when we were quarantined, I'm pretty sure everybody felt like they gained weight or everybody at some point gained weight. You don't want to, you don't want to sit down and not do anything. That's why I exercise. Another thing that I want to do more of is reading books because my mom pushes me on reading. I ain't, at first I didn't used to like it, but now that I'm starting to um write, and being that I have a creative writing class, I have to, I have to read more if I want to know more words. And I actually witnessed this one time. I read, I had read a whole book. I read the um, it was a biography. It was an LL Cool J biography. I forget what the word was, but it was like a really cool word. And I kept saying it because it meant something to me. I'm like, I just learned something new. Mm -hmm. She was like, Yeah, see what happens when you read. You just add to your vocabulary. <laughs> So like reading and writing, they always gonna go hand in hand. If you can't read, then you can't write. How you gonna write if you don't know what the letters say on the paper? And if you're gonna read, you always wanna expand your vocabulary. Like I said, you don't wanna be a square. You wanna be a circle. You wanna be different. You wanna have different things. You wanna have different outlets. You always wanna have different outlets because yeah, yeah it's okay to it's okay to have something to do that you really like, but you don't want to stay stuck to it. Never yeah. box yourself in. Always be open-minded. Thank you for that, Chris. I can talk a little bit how I um, practice self-care. I think for me, a lot of the folks that I organize with, we're all very close friends as well. There's a lot of trust in those relationships. So, you know, off the work or activism hours, we just be hanging out. And that's really like just kind of recentering myself like in the work just reconnecting with my friends connecting with my family i'm spending time in the environment 
um, going for walks, all of those things like help me stay sane throughout um, community activism work. And I, I know when I'm overwhelmed or not at 100%, I can't perform or um, advocate for others um, the way that I need to. So it's always important for me to like step, take a step back. Oh, I also have been using the word no a lot more often, just saying, do not, nope, that can't go to this event. I'm sorry, can't do that, can't do that. I need to prioritize um, schoolwork, my job. I have other priorities. And, you know, kind of handing off those uh, potential opportunities to other young people, making the space a little bit more inclusive and ensuring that everyone gets the opportunity to go to these different events. I think saying no has also like really helped me stay sane. It's a love word. It is a love word. No is a love word. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to say I was um, in this meeting and someone said um, my empathetic no makes room for my enthusiastic yes. And I keep that close by. I agree. I 100% agree with that. Um, I want to start by talking about specifically when I was in high school and more involved in organizing how I did not take care of my mental health. Um, I, so it, my, my thing over quarantine was coming to terms with things that I'd experienced um, and just how messed up they were uh, because it's so easy to be in a situation and to problem solve, problem solve, problem solve, but to not really think about what the problem exactly is that you're solving or what you're, what you are responding to. Um, Isa and I and Chris talked about this a little bit beforehand, but being a young person in a space that is often adult dominated can be exhausting because of tokenization, but it can also be exhausting because a lot of adults will put you in situations without a lot of regard for your mental health or what will happen to you in those spaces. And that happened to me a lot in high school. I was invited to um, sit in rooms with people at my high school with administrators and teachers or invited to sit on district level committees. And my words weren't taken seriously, but it's one thing to not be validated with the actions that go behind it, but it's also another thing to hear about what people think of you, what adults think of you, and, and how, um, how harmful those words can be, especially when you're not hearing about them in the moment, but you're seeing more of the action. Um, and so hearing like after I graduated that there were teachers and administrators who thought that I needed to be humbled or who thought that um, I wasn't doing what I needed to do well or that I didn't know what I was talking about and seeing or looking back on my experiences and seeing um, administrators ask me to sit in rooms and then intentionally invalidate what I was saying publicly in front of other adults as though to diminish what I was saying made it really hard for me like in college to trust myself and to trust my instincts because like I said earlier like these were things that I cared about not because I wanted to look a certain way but because it was my life and it was the life of people that I cared about and it is hard to put myself now even in those positions where I don't know if I'm being used or I'm being tokenized in a way that I'm not going to be, but I'm not going to be fully aware of until much later, much further down the road. But especially my senior year of high school, when I was invited into those spaces and not really sure of what was going on, I was constantly doing, I was constantly doing something, constantly engaged in something. And my mom asked me, she was like, why do you always have something to do? Not like one of those, like, oh, you're so involved in so many extracurriculars, but she was like, why do you say yes to so many things? And I told her, I was like, I'm afraid that if I say no, that things won't get done or voices won't be heard. And that's a, that's a horrible position to put any person in, to feel like they, if they aren't saying something, then nothing will be done because solutions aren't, or movements aren't based on one person. It's based on a collective. It's based on a community. And I had a sense of community with my friends. Like I was saying, people that I organized with, I was really close friends with, but I was so scared to put them in those spaces because I didn't want to put other people through what I was going through. Mm -hmm. And so for me now, like protecting my mental health looks like saying no to a lot of different things, but it also looks like taking a lot more time for myself that are completely separate um, from spaces just in general. Like I, Chris talked about it, but I love to read and I've read, I've started reading stuff that is connected to issues that I care about. But like right now I'm, I'm reading 
this book, The Mysterious Benedict Society. It's a young adult book and I love it. And I've started doing a lot more stuff like that that's just meant for me. And even if it is related to stuff that I care about, I'm not doing it for the sake of anyone else. Because Isa talked about this earlier, you can't, or Chris talked about this and Isa actually, you can't be a good person for other people if you're not a good person for yourself. And I think self-love is so often not talked about within activism because there's this expectation that you, because the issues you're talking about are not specific to you, they're specific to a larger group, that you are responsible for being the advocate or the speaker for that entire group. But there's, I think the individuality of young people in activism is often lost because we do center their narratives in relation to a larger picture and it's harmful. So yeah, recently I've been just trying to make sure that I take time for myself to do things that I love to do, not because other people also like them or other people see value in them, but because I see value in them. Can I quickly comment on what Amina just said? Because it, it really just spoke to me because mm. just being like forcefully put in those spaces by adults I think it was intentional to dishearten and kind of just warp your thinking that, you know, this, whatever you're trying to accomplish is beyond you and that you don't know enough to help even come up with solutions. I think adults have definitely intentionally put young people in those spaces to slow um, our movements, right? So I think it, and this goes back to one of the earlier questions, like how can adults be better essentially? And I think adults who wanna work in like activist spaces with young people should be required to undergo some sort of training to understand that, you know, young people are bringing lived experiences that need to be validated, that need to be centered. So I think it should be, the burden should be on the adults to make the, the change within themselves to hear that because I don't know, I hear, Oh, I, I, okay, I just saw Jennifer's uh, comment in the chat. And I, I do kind of take qualm with the saying that like, oh, the youth of the future. No, I am out here today. The youth are the people of the now. I am right here. I am trying my best. So I think it's really on the burden of adults to make those kinds of shifts in their mindset to really welcome and center young voices authentically in their work. I do want to say one really quick thing, Isa, based off of what you said, and then also Jennifer's comment. Um, when we think of this concept of community or the, con first of all, community and collective, in my opinion, can be synonymous, but they are different because when we look at community, people think of community as hierarchy and everyone has a specific role they're playing and certain roles need to be uplifted or validated more than others. Whereas in my opinion, a collective is more about everyone working towards a common goal or the collective good, right? And everyone has a role in that work that looks different, but it's what it's based on their abilities and also based on what we think is needed in that moment. So often young people are left out of the collective because that concept of hierarchy is harped on them more than anyone else. Like you don't know as much, so you can't do as much. Or whenever you try to do a lot, you're not really doing what you think you're doing. Um, but young people are just as much as part of a part of the collective as anyone else. And I mean, the larger the community, the harder it can be for a collective to acknowledge that. But even just, just like looking on a smaller scale, looking within a household, for example, right? You can have the parent or the parents and then the children, right? As like the basic structure that some people will think of for a family. The way that a household operates isn't just based on what the parent or parents dictate. It is also based on the responses that children have and the things that they do within their household. Sometimes there's this idea that young people are just supposed to respond based on what they're told to do. And that even if they do have a concern, if the people in the position of power are not really willing to hear that, that they know more and that we should just go ahead and listen and that their experiences are just because they haven't lived enough. When in reality, I think we don't acknowledge that sometimes this, the things we're imposing on young people are just a result of a cycle. It's not because we've really thought out whether or not the things that we're doing should be done. It's just because we've always done them and they were done to me. And at some point we've got to get out of that mentality that that's a valid reason to do anything in life and that there needs to be some time and some space for reassessment. Mm. Yeah, thank you for all of that. That like, so true. Um, and so I, what I want to ask lastly is really thinking about the future. 
what legacy do you hope to leave in Durham or, you know, otherwise? The legacy I want to leave in Durham is to be, well, I grew up being the youngest. So I want to say the youngest leader, the youngest leader to lead these teenagers to be something great, just to be something, just to do something, just, it don't even got to be anything related to the community. Just give somebody motivation to do something with their life, do something with themselves, do something that makes you happy and that mm -hmm. requires you to use your thinking power so you can be productive and successful because successful is not based on money or your social status. Success is feeling like you accomplished something and it's and it feels like you you're comfortable with what you're doing. That's what success is. That's what success is to me. Thank you for that, Chris. Absolutely. I can go next. Speaking of um, just wanting to create a more inclusive movement and just bringing in more young people of color, like. For example, I currently sit as the youngest person to ever serve on a Durham City County board, an advisory board. And that shouldn't be the case, um, especially on something like an environmental advisory board. If these are truly problems of the future, then why aren't young people asked their opinion and being given compensation and voting privileges in these decision-making spaces? So my legacy, um, I would like to see just more in inclusivity, more seats for young people specifically on these sort of power structures and these boards. I wanna see young people sitting on the school board. Like why aren't mm -hmm. any students, especially students of color sitting on the Durham Public Schools Board of Education? Why aren't young people like um, with, besides just being in the office on youth? Cause I feel like oftentimes youth are kind of like relegated to these for youth spaces, but why can't young people be working in the mayor's office? Why can't mm. young people mm. like, be working um, on the racial equity task force? Why can't young people be working in housing or on the transit plan? And it seems like young people are only called on to work in these areas when we think we might need um, some youth advice, you know? And I, I kind of hate that um, young, like young people is like kind of like the separate box that we only want to tap in to consider when we want to um, make our, our um, decisions seem more authentic. So I, I think my legacy is to really make these spaces truly more inclusive and safe for young people to feel like they can authentically participate in. I, yeah, I, oh, I love listening to y'all talk because I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I mentioned earlier, but I want to be a high school social studies teacher. And my, I think my, one of my biggest advocates or biggest supporters in school was a teacher that I didn't even have, Dr. Swain, love her to death. Um, and it was less because of what she was doing inside of the classroom and more how she engaged with students outside of the classroom. Um, and how she advocated for them within the schools at like staff meetings or individual meetings that she would have with administrators. But I think a lot of times within education, we are missing teachers who encourage students to learn outside of the parameters of education and who will also provide them with those connections because you know teachers will say in class sometimes, it's not just about what you learn in the classroom, it's what you do outside of the classroom. But when you're not offering students opportunities to make those connections or to do anything outside of the classroom, then it's just meaningless words. And so for me, the legacy I wanna leave behind um, is not just as a teacher, but a person who makes sure that in any space that I'm in, people who need to be uplifted are uplifted and people who need to be brought in are brought in, but also knowing when to take a step back and knowing when, and I think that'll be the, difference from when I'm like now versus 10 years in the future when I'm not necessarily a youth person anymore, knowing when it's time to take a step back and help make those transitions um, between young people and adults in that moment. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful conversation. Um, I know 
uh, we are a little bit short up on time, uh, but there are uh, two questions uh, that was asked in sort of the um, uh, question section. So if, uh, if someone can answer, I'm gonna just ask, ask one of these and if someone feels compelled to answer really quickly feel to do so. Um, and I'm not sure if this came up in the chat. So if I ask a question that's already been answered, excuse me. Uh, but uh, someone asked, um, so how can adults provide additional support during the hours that you are all are at school or at work? Can you describe um, some current needs? Actually listening to what we gotta say and not going by the rules. I think they gotta understand like, well, are you talking about like school or just in general? Um, they were sort of saying if you need additional support during the hours of trying to do, um, uh, you know, your activism, uh, what other, um, like how can you be helped during that so that you can still be in school, uh, do work, and then also be doing your um, participating in activism? Hmm. Ooh, I think... Um... Well, being that everybody is busy, I think, I don't think that we should have like one specific day. I think we should have like, it should be like a three day week thing and whoever can make it, makes it. And then whoever doesn't, they just have to make the next meeting. And then we just go like, like every three days of a week, we're discussing a topic. So nobody will feel like they missed anything unless they missed all three of those days because they were busy and it don't need it doesn't need to be three consecutive days the days need to be split apart so like people have time to get work done in between and so whenever they finish that they can either join the meeting or they're able to meet up and then whoever missed it they can also hold on i'm in a i'm in a meeting hold on they can also um I didn't lost train of thought because my dad opened my door. <laughs> but, um, they can just come back to the meeting so they won't feel like they, they're left behind. We need to have like three three different days and we're discussing the same topic for those three days of that week. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, we do have to wrap up and we can ask um, some other questions once we uh, end the recording. Uh, but I just wanna say thank you all so much uh, for being a part of this conversation. This has really filled me up. Um, I am so happy that I was able to like be in this space with, space with you all. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Laura, Laura to do some like final closing out. <laughs>